Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Bear Elite Project. How the heck are you? This is going to be a very detailed podcast. There's a lot to discuss today. Now, Julian Assange had an interview a short time ago where he was getting into what he described as intelligent, evil dust everywhere. And he said they could put it in paper, they could put it in mirrors, they could spread. It's just, it said it's everywhere and in everything. So the question is, what is intelligent dust? I've heard of smart dust before. So is he referring to a nanotype smart dust? I would think so. Now, also, I want to let you know we've got a great guest on the show today, Jeffrey Darty. He has a wonderful YouTube channel, also website. I'll leave the links in the video description box. But I would like you to listen to something real quick. I'd like you to listen to something real quick. And then I want to show you directly from MIT a game that is going to be played called uh, Be Me. It's called Be Me. It's literally like the, the new version of John Malkovich, being John Malkovich. It's wild. So it's where a group of humans control another human, where this guy just relinquishes control and everything they tell him to do, he's going to do. And they're doing that in attempts to thwart off an evil artificial intelligence. And this is why this is all while DARPA is actually coming up with another $2 billion program that they are spending on artificial intelligence to make it smarter and to actually make it our friend, to make it our companion, not just our tool. And I'm going to share those links with you. It's really exciting, but just listen to this real quick. Will you just listen to it? Here we go. Intelligent evil dust uh, scattered everywhere like, like confetti in everything. Yep, that's right. That's Julian Assange, ladies and gentlemen. Smart dust everywhere and in everything. I'll bet you that's going to make you sleep good at night. This is the Be Me program, the first reality augmented game where algorithms make most of our decisions for us. One individual will entirely give up their free will for a day to be guided by a large crowd of users through an epic quest to defeat an evil AI who is in charge, who is responsible for one's actions. Where does the individual end and others begin? So also, I'd like to let you know real quick, this podcast is brought to you by emailwithleak.com. Emailwithleak.com is a enterprise security encryption email cloud communication service. You can use it on your laptop, on your cell phone, on your mobile device, on your computer. And it is incredibly secure at a very fine price point. Click the link, get the discounts. You definitely want to get this or you could have the opportunity to where they take all that information and create a virtual reality you in living in perpetuity like that X-Files TV show. That was pretty wild. So I dive again. Be me, MIT. We just look at it. Be me's giant social experiment puts a human under internet control. Oh, yeah. There, there's nothing that's going to go wrong there. So, Jeff, hey, man, it's great to have you on the program. It's been a long time. You've got tens of thousands of hours of research into biblical prophecies. And it's going to be interesting to see how we can kind of incorporate this into some of the depictions and revelation, if any. So thanks for coming on the show. It's always my pleasure to be invited, invited into Rextopia. It's a, it's a land like none other. It certainly is a land like none other. That's, I will agree with you on that. It's, it's a bit bizarre out here. So what do, you, what do you think about this MIT experiment, man, where they're taking social you know, networks, they're incorporating what people are thinking in the heat of the battle, fighting against an evil AI algorithm? Well, Rex, it's amazing. And the reason why you have 300,000 subscribers and why you're Rex Bear is you notice things like the transition from smart dust to intelligent dust. That's something that's so subtle. It's something that's so hidden. It's something they expect to just flash by everybody. Smart dust, intelligent dust, what's the difference? But you're perceptive enough to pick up on the profound difference between something that's smart. I mean, your smartphone is smartphone, but when you go into intelligence, you're talking about uh, something that can think for itself, something that can plan for itself, something that has gained another level of autonomy. And when we go from smart dust to intelligent dust, that's a big link, a big leap. And I'm so glad that we have uh, the leak project to help keep us on point with these things. But this reminds me, Rex, of a movie I saw and it was a brilliant movie. If you've never seen it, go rent it if you can. It was called Gamer, and it had um, Gerard Butler, and it had the guy from Dexter, Michael C. Hall. And it was about this same thing, Be Me, only they actually had the, the person uh, in some type of a 
artificial reality where the real guy and Gerard Butler was the guy. And it was actually literally physically controlled by gamers. And what a tremendous movie it was. And Rex, you know, here, I guess it looks like they're just going to tell you what to do and you just do it. But you know what the next step is? Well, let's implant some things. Let's let's because we love you so much. Let's get you hooked up and let's turn it into a real AI game where you're really controlled by others. And let's take prostitution and gaming and and to an entirely new level. Well, I don't even think they're going to need to chip you. I think they're going to be able to do it wirelessly. Absolutely. And we want to do it conveniently, Rex. No wires. Let's do it because they love us so much. They want it to be convenient and easy. Well, not only that, but it's just convenient and easy, but complete control. I mean, it's one thing if somebody has the right to say, yes, I'll take the implant. But if you don't even have that right, now they just have complete clandestine control. What is a better way to control a society, a planet, a group of individuals, anybody at any time than to have them under a wireless frequency control grid that they don't know anything about? Now, this right here is directly from DARPA. And, you know, hey, this is this is all just opinion, folks. And if, if you think it's a good thing, that's great. I'm just bringing the information to the table. You can come up with your own decision. I find it fascinating. And technology can be used for good or bad. So let's hope they're going to use it for good. Let's let's hope and pray that it's going to be used for good, because with where they're going and the advancements of technology, imagine a supercomputer that can calculate quadrillions of floating points per second that's the size of a nanoparticulate that's so small you can't even see it with your eyes that could be floating around you ne um, networking with other supercomputer miniature nanocomputers and deciding what would be best for you and in return best for them now this ai next campaign let me share this with you real quick this is fascinating over the past few years, there has been an explosion of interest in a subfield of AI dubbed machine learning that applies statistical and probabilistic methods, probabilistic methods, na -na 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 -na, to large <laughs> data sets to create generalized representations that can be applied to future samples. Foremost among these approaches are deep learning, artificial neural networks that can be trained to perform a variety of classification and prediction tasks when adequate historical data is available. Therein lies the rub. What kind of rub are you talking about? However, as the task of collecting, labeling, and vetting data on which the train such second wave AI techniques is prohibitively costly and time consuming. So what does DARPA do about it? This is where DARPA steps in, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this is like the Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? DARPA. DARPA envisions a future in which machines, you got to listen to this part. This is the most exciting, where machines are more than just tools that execute human programmed rules or generalized from human curated data sets. Rather, the machine's DARPA envisions will function more as colleagues than as tools. Towards this end, DARPA research and development and human machine symbiosis sets a goal to partner with machines. DARPA is focusing its investments on a third wave of AI that brings forth machines that understand and reason in context. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is, is it, isn't it amazing how you turn on the TV and you've got about 30 different TV shows right now or movies that are new releases um, that are projecting the machine as more human than the human, more humane. Watch that humans TV show. I think they're filming that in, uh, in the UK. And these robots that look just like us, some of them become self-aware. And then they decide to rebel against their makers, just like these ancient tablets talk about. Well, now what happens if you've got a network of these micro robots that are smarter than most humans, at least at the conscious level, and they have access to all this data and they're working in conjunction together and they're learning from us to make themselves greater. It's not science fiction anymore when you look at some of this data. At least it's not science fiction in the sense of in the lab, this is what they're attempting to create. It just said right there, they want, a, some, uh, they want harmony. They want us to be colleagues with robots. So what happens now when robots have the same rights as we do? Or in some countries like Saudi Arabia, the robot that, um, what's her name, Sophia, and she thinks she classifies herself as female, she has citizenship in Saudi Arabia and more rights than women do in Saudi Arabia. So where, where is this going to go? What is the next level? Well, look at this. This is quantum assisted nano imaging of living organisms via DARPA. They're showing you, these are pictures. This is 500 nanometers in size, 
500 nanometers in size right there. Well, it's a little bit more than that because you can see that's just a reference point. It's more like 1,000, maybe 1,200 nanometers. So how big is that? Well, that is approximately the size of a bacteria. So they can go into bacteria. They can go into living cells now and take pictures and video footage inside of these cells and send it back wirelessly to the network. Isn't this exciting? And here's another one. Hey, how about this? It's all conspiracy, Rex. You're just a conspiracy theorist, Rex. Nanochip system measures light from single bacterial cell to enable chemical detection, science daily. Or how about CRISPR? Gene editing, where they can take out just individual pieces of your DNA. We're not in Kansas anymore, Jeff. Where are we at? Well, Rex, I know that we're just conspiracy theorists, and I know that it's just Julian Assange talking about intelligent dust. I know it's just on the internet, all of these things about AI control and merging and smart machines. And Rex, maybe we're wrong. Maybe it's a whole lot easier than controlling people with Wi-Fi. Why not, since we can pull a piece of a gene out, why not, since we can do things and manipulate things and insert things, into particles that are the size of bacterium, why don't we just put these in AI, this AI dust, and let's, why don't we just spread it from our, with our chemtrails and stuff, and why don't we just have people breathe it in? Because Rex, we don't even need to have volunteers anymore. We can volunteer our own volunteers. We can cover them with intelligent dust. They can breathe in this nanotechnology, and they can be controlled by us, and Rex, Maybe they don't even think they're being controlled by us. Maybe they think it's their own idea. And wouldn't that make for a better game show? What if they can make it their own idea? Where exactly. That's what I meant. You said it well, much no, better. I mean, let's go. Let's take it to. No, I know. I know what you're saying there, but let's take it to the next level where they actually rewrite their brain to where they don't even need to interface them anymore. They're going to think the way that they're programmed to think without any Wi-Fi interference, anything. Like this is an example. Take a look at this, folks. This is a diagram of the, and that's an incredible, you're making some great points here, Jeff. You're making too much sense. You better stop. The <laughs> diagram of the CRISPR, this right here, antiviral defense mechanism. You've got this virus that injects something. Oh, yeah. It injects it into the mm. cell membrane. And now it's taking double-stranded viral DNA, and it's inactivating other strands of DNA. And it's also getting to the point to where they can individually pull these strands out. Now, I remember 10 years ago watching a, a quick blurb on the news where they took some DNA of a fly and they changed just one strand of the fly and it had red eyes. Do you remember that? Did you see that? I did like see 10 that. years ago. So now gets to a point where let's, what's bacteriophage? Bacteriophage is a virus that's, cre that's created, it's natural, but now they can manipulate them and they've kind of fine tuned them, bacteriophages that will eat E. coli. So they spray that on food. They don't even have to tell people about it. They spray it oftentimes on cold cuts and uh, seafood, different shellfish, et cetera. And this will act, it's a virus that will inject itself into this bacteria and eat the bacteria. So you've probably seen Resident Evil where they take the T virus or the movie with Will Smith in it. Um, I don't remember what that's called, where they come up with a virus that kills cancer, but it also mutates people. Uh, mad cow disease. You've got these different diseases and problems that have been occurring more and more over the, ca uh, you know, over the past 30, 40 years. And, and a lot of people are speculating that might have something to do with this bacteriophage, these live viruses that are spraying on food that's designed to eat E. coli. What are your thoughts? I think the movie was called Legend, Rex, if I'm, if I'm not incorrect. But yes. here's my thoughts. And, you know, I'm pretty much a one-trick pony. I talk about religion and the fear and guilt control matrix and indoctrinating people. And, you know, for 2,000 years, Rex, at least, you know, in our, our Western society, there's been this concerted effort to indoctrinate people by convincing them to think things and to a great extent by controlling the information they have access to and controlling the information they hear and controlling the media that, that they consume. But that, if you think about it, is a bit of a laborious 
procedure. You've got to put out this information. You've got to put out enough of this information. You've got to keep these people from getting access to just turning that information off. And then when you got people like Rex Bear come along, you've got to try to keep them from competing information. But wouldn't it be easy if you could just throw out some intelligent dust, have these people breathe it in, and you don't have to worry anymore about how much they consume because you just need a little bitty bit. You don't have to worry anymore about them turning off the information because they can't. You don't have to worry about them seeking out competing information because you can literally indoctrinate people and get them to, ch you can change them on a, on a atom level and turn them into what you want them to be. Rex, this is the ultimate indoctrination. And the scary part is if it's hardwired, if it becomes part of our very basic self, Will we ever be able, Rex, to have the opportunity to unindoctrinate ourselves afterwards? It just depends on who you are, how powerful your mind is. There's been you know, the, the constant battle of man versus machine for, I mean, I, I guess you could take it back to the beginning of time. There's always a polar opposite. There's always a nemesis. And it seems to make humanity stronger and more powerful as a whole although it seems that many people will suffer the consequences because of it, yet those that are truly mind over matter, they practice what they preach, they're being the change that they want to see. If they're in their life path, I feel they have a much better advantage and, and, and will get through a lot of this uh, dark ecstasy that seems to be permeating around the world today. Like DNA is, is dual binary code. So we are beings that, in a sense, are like machines, but we're organic machines. Uh, we, people can be programmed like machines. That's why the government was so heavily involved with the MK Ultra stuff for so long. And, and now they've just got so many different offshoots that really who knows what name they use or what trigger they use. They've probably got it to a science now where they can put stuff in TV shows and movies and based upon the colors and, and the, um, the scene itself and the sounds and the, the script that goes behind it, they can probably control entire populations and orchestrate the future of commerce and industry based upon those levels of energies. I mean, it's, it's magic at its finest. But I think that where we're going right now with this programming of the mind, they know that people, not everybody's going to just roll over. Not everybody's just going to you know, get on their knees and, and start kissing the feet of their masters. So... I think they're looking for all these diversion tactics right now and anything that they can do to give them an edge or help them control the narrative, whether it be nano dust, whether it be genetically modified foods, whether it be spraying lithium, you know, or put all of these things have just a, a little piece in this gigantic puzzle that they want to put together exactly how they want to, even if the pieces don't fit, you know, they're going to, okay, well, this is a one size fits all. Let's cut the, that piece the way we want it. And there's going to be consequences somewhere else in the universe. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So every time they do something negative to the world or to us, or every time they push us in a certain way, we are going to respond. And some of us will respond with an opposite reaction. You know, some people say, you will not assimilate me. Abracadabra, come get me. You're not going to get me because I'm not there. I'm over here. And then they come over there and you're just everywhere at once or nowhere at once. It's like a quantum computer. Like, how do we get it? We can't because it's everywhere at once. So now I'm divagating, Jeff. Help me out. Well, Rex, you know, one of the reasons that you're the man, the myth, the legend is because you bring us to these places and help us to think of these things on our own. And I'm, I, I'm just pondering, and you've done a lot, of, a lot of favors for me, and one of them was introducing me to Jay Campbell. And Jay Campbell is a guy that teaches us how to optimize ourselves physically. And for those of you that, that don't know who the hell I am, which is a lot of you, and I understand that, you know, a year ago when Rex and I first met, I weighed 65 pounds more than I do right now. I had 15 pounds less muscle mass than I do right now. And Jay Campbell came into my life, started working with me, got me to the place where I could get myself not quite there yet, but pretty close to physical optimization. Well, what difference does that make? Our only chance, Rex, I think, with the forces that we're facing, environmental, energetic, psychological, uh, mental, emotional, with all of these weapons that are being arrayed against us, the only chance we really have 
is to get ourselves into full-blown physical optimization. And I can tell you, cousins, when you're in physical optimization, it's a lot easier for you to be in spiritual optimization. It's a lot easier for you to be in mental optimization. It's a lot easier for you to be in emotional optimization. And if we're literally, Rex, going to be fighting off intelligent bugs at the bacterium size level, we've got to be in physical optimization. And that means we can't keep going through the drive throughs We can't keep pounding the GMOs. We've got to wake up and realize that this is a war and we have to act like warriors if we're going to survive. But then again, Rex, I am a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, that's a, that's a badge of honor. That's a compliment. And it's a good thing you are, because if you weren't, then we probably wouldn't be able to have as uh, exciting as a conversation or at least get into different variables. You know, I was having a great conversation with Diamond from Oppenheimer Ranch earlier today. And I was saying, hey, look, man, I, I've got an open mind. I've definitely got an open mind. You have to have an open mind for it to work. Otherwise, it's like a parachute. It just doesn't work if it doesn't open. But my mind isn't so open that my brain falls out on the sidewalk. So you've got to, ha- it can't, you've got to use discernment. And it's amazing that I can go back 15, 20 years, 15 years ago, I was talking about smart dust. I remember having a discussion with a gentleman that, I mean, he's probably got an IQ 170, very, very high intelligent person. And back in the eighties, he was working with the star Wars program and stuff that, you know, was classified for a lot of years. And we were talking about smart dust and I was telling him, my, this was 15 years ago. I was telling him my opinions on the smart dust and we we're talking about the Iraq war. And I was saying, well, they've, they've admitted that they've got smart dust out there now. That's a network of this, uh, these microchips. They're not the size of dust, a speck of dust, but these small microchips that are scattered throughout the desert where they can use to, you know, to track what's going on. And he would say, oh, no, it's not that small yet. And da, da, da. I'm like, no, dude, they're getting to the point now because he was still stuck in that 80s mindset, that late 80s mindset. And that's what's interesting when I get in these conversations with very intelligent people that were part of these government contracts and these top secret programs. They oftentimes seem to be stuck at that point. You know, you're 10 years down the road and you're talking about these new technologies. You're like, no, that, that's, that doesn't exist because this is the way it is. Well, like, yeah, 10 years ago, that's the way it was. Well, what was the fastest computer 10 years ago versus now? What was the size of it versus now? So I, I think that really people need to get out of this. Those that are very intelligent oftentimes are so smart that they get in their own way. You just kind of got to get out of it. But let me, let me get into this real quick. This is showing you the hydrogen wave function. We're looking at atoms and the energies and the orbits that are emitted with these different atoms. So think about, for example, here's another. You've got the nucleus and the orbit, protons, neutrons, electrons, oscillating in certain frequencies, right? That's you've got your natural harmony, and then you can have these artificial resonances that are created, and you can influence matter with sound, with vibration. And it reminds me, microcosm, macrocosm, as above, so below. That's not just a, you know, it's interesting when I hear people say, oh man, you're a devil worshiper, dude. You said as above, so below, you must worship the dark Lord. It's like, are you really that ignorant? And I'm not saying ignorant in a rude sense. That's just how unknowledgeable they are. As above, so below is also a term of, it's like the microcosm, the macrocosm. You're looking at the planets and the heavens, and you're looking at these planets that orbit in certain, you know, they've got certain orbits, et cetera. Same as our atoms, same as our cells. Everything is connected, and, and size is irrelevant if we live in an infinite space. Every number, in a sense, is the same. And then you look at this right here. If you want to look at somatics, this is also going to incorporate with the smart dust. If you're spraying the world with these microparticulates, with these nanoparticulates that can get embedded in people's pores and in their nervous systems. I've read reports from eight years ago that talks about how they were using nanotechnology, that these nanochips would piggyback rides off of bacteria and viruses, get lodged into people and animals, and they would track these things and they would launch off and do their, you know, do what they were programmed to do. So you spray the entire world with particulates and chemicals and certain adjuvants and and metals. And then you've got a planet that is also under this network of frequencies where you've got a control grid and you've got somatics on a global scale. What you're looking at here is somatics, sound waves, sound waves influencing matter, sound waves right here. This is 11 hertz. This is the vibration of 11 hertz. 
and you're looking at the somatics. Now, if we go to a different Hertz frequency, this is 12.5 Hertz. This is what water looks like under 12.5 Hertz. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, your bodies are made up of majorly wa of mainly water. So when you're walking around cell towers all the time and radio towers, whether it's 3G, 4G, or 5G, in my opinion, and based on a lot of other research and data, it can influence you at a molecular level. So this is 12 and a half Hertz. Now this is 1480 Hertz. If you wanna see what 1480 Hertz looks like, this is somatics. So you can get a piece of paper and you can, you can put some dust or some particulates on that piece of paper and then you turn up these frequencies or you, these sound waves to these particular frequencies and these are the patterns that you are going to get when you do this. So once again, imagine the world being a piece of paper now we're going to have a flat earthers coming out here, Jeff. We better watch you out. <laughs> the land of the flatliners, they're coming out. They're jumping off the edge. Come back, come back, come back to us. It's okay. So you've got this global network of all of these radar systems and satellite systems and radio antennas, et cetera, emitting these waves. And then they hit these microparticulates and nanoparticulates. Imagine what that could do to somebody's body. Imagine somebody or an entire city, an entire civilization, an entire country. What are your thoughts? Well, Rex, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy to hear you say that size is irrelevant. That makes me feel a whole lot better. And one of the things that... Act, act, act. One of the things that I think about when you showed the diagram, you know, it's not so much the electrons that concern me or the protons or the neutrons. It's really the morons that are, are causing most of our problem. But the thing we've got to realize today is we no longer have the ability to be conscientious objectors. I remember I was in the Air Force for six years and I had a buddy that got out of the Air Force because he became a Jehovah's Witness and he was a conscientious objector. But we don't have the option anymore to be conscientious objectors. We don't have the option anymore to be non-combatants because whether you like it or not, whether you want to pretend or not pretend, you are in a battle and this is a battle not only, this is not just, this is not about life or death, it's more important than that. It's about what happens beyond this life, what happens beyond this death, where you go, go what you do, who you become. And Rex, as you were talking about the semantics and putting dust on the paper and having these particular formations uh, come out, what came into my mind, Rex, and I want to see what comes into that mind of yours about this, if you've got intelligent dust and you're affecting it with semantics, what are the implications of the effect of somatics on intelligent dust? Well, it depends on what it's programmed to do. If you've got these nanoparticulates that are miniaturized computer chips that interact with other computer chips at that scale, then you could have something of unprecedented proportions. I mean, if each chip equals a certain amount of computing power and then you link them all together, and another thing that was discussed with Julian Assange with, these intelligent, with the intelligent evil dust he described it as, he said that they're actually activated with GSM radio waves. So you'll wow. have these GSM radio waves that will interact with these smart particulates that allow them. So here's another thing, too. If you can actually, like, remember the Pi computers that came out uh, several years ago? And they're like, this is going to change everything. It's a $15 computer that fits in the palm of your hand, and you can do what you want with it. And they're pretty cool, right? So they're not, I don't think they change the world, but maybe in a little bit. And they are cheap, and they're getting smaller now. So imagine taking your computer and being able to put it onto something that is the size of a piece of sand. Or now we can be getting into the nano level. It's, it fits in a thousand nanometer cube, a thousand nanometer cube. So what would that be? Let me show you a comparison here. A thousand nanometer cube would be the size of a bacteria. So you've got supercomputers the size of pieces of bacteria, and then they can self-replicate. Now it would be such as these, they, they've learned how to take nanobots and they will self-replicate themselves. So you put an algorithm that's linked with the wireless networks and the satellites and the cell towers, except just, just a signal, just an actual frequency that would then interact with that algorithm inside of that nano computer that's the size of a piece of bacteria that would allow it to take other pieces 
other molecules and rewrite those molecules and self-replicate. You could just take bits and pieces out of the air, essentially, kind of like you've got these, uh, these water condensers, these air condensers that will turn air into water by con condensing the hydrogen molecules out there. Well, now imagine these nanobots that are just picking these things up and you can't even see them and they're building them together like, a, like an ant colony. It'd be like an ant colony of supercomputers, the piece that are the size of bacteria. And so this is so beyond Terminator. I mean, Terminator is scary enough to think about these computers and these, these androids that can self-replicate and build themselves. And they've got this liquid metal, which I showed a podcast just a few days ago, well, a few weeks ago, programmable liquid metal that you can fry and then it will, it will, when the temperatures get back to where they need to be, it will go back to the form that it was designed to be. That's like Terminator 2. But imagine having Terminator 2s running around that are the size of nanoparticulates that you can't even see. They could be nowhere everywhere at one time. There's a billion of them out there. There's a trillion of them out there. You don't even see them. But then there's some algorithm that's connected with the radio wave that decides to put all them together like Voltron. Rex, I don't even know what to say. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of an old guy and I remember back in, I think it was 1981, maybe 1982. I remember that I got this advanced piece of machinery. I got this thing that was so advanced and so powerful and it revolutionized my life. It was called a Commodore 64 and it was amazing. And here we are not too many years later and that commodore 64 is a joke and rex things are moving at such breakneck speed things are coming at us faster literally than we can almost um, learn about them and be able to react to them it really is a challenge and besides being able to be connected into the league project and some of the other great uh, shows out there rex what do people do in the face of this all out campaign to turn us into the Borg. It's gonna be the being John Malkovich in real life for those that choose to, I guess, kiss the right, you know what, to get to that level or wait, no, of course not. It's not who you know, it's what you know. I mean, I don't know. Here's, here's, I don't know. I don't know anything. I mean, this is all just a big conspiracy, but I will say I find it fascinating that there is a program out there right now called Be Me via MIT that I've shared at the beginning, a reality augmented game where a social network of people will tell somebody what to do, where to do, when to, you know, when to do it. And that person is giving up complete control to a bunch of strangers on a social network. And then what they're doing is they're battling an AI algorithm and that's all the information we have right now. So that to me reminds me of being John Malkovich in real life. But instead of jumping into some little uh, staircase, you're actually going into a technological aspect of right now. And where is this going to be in the future? One of my favorite movies that I saw, also check out emailwithleak.com, secure your information. One of my favorite movies 20 years ago, was, was the movie Strange Days, Strange Days. And Strange Days should have been a huge box office hit. And I guess it was just too far ahead for the, the populace at the time. It, I don't even think it was in theaters that long, but in the film, there's this technology, like you put on this little cap and you can go out and do something and it records everything like it's you. Like, you know, so you can go back and watch it and you feel the emotions of that person. You can smell what that person is smelling, hear and see and experience everything that that person is experiencing, just like you're them. And this was 20 years ago. So I am thinking the next level is going to be some type of technology, might even be now, where they've got these frequency machines that will record the frequency of for an example, an insect. Like let's, let's say they want to get eyes and ears on somebody and they can't, even with all their technology, but they can get a grasshopper in there or there's an insect that's just naturally in there. Is there a way for them to tap into the vision of that insect, into the hearing of that little fly on the wall and, and to, to pick up what's going on? And that's not far-fetched, especially when you, when you learn how they do it with wires. So now they're just kind of moving from wires to wirelessly. 
And if we were created by the Anunnaki or the Elohim, a superior race and technology and advancements, they might have put some type of code like that in our DNA. So if they wanted to tap into us like a drone, like a VR drone, they could tap into us and see what we're seeing, hearing what we're hearing. But when will our, when will, when will our own people, when will these shadow factions and these technological groups that are contracted with those that love us so much, when will they get that access and that information and start using it and then go into a whole minority report style effect? And then in conjunction with the smart dust, they could eliminate a threat before it even existed. Wow. You know, Rex, though, one of the reasons why I like to come on this channel is because I learn amazing things. Like today, I've just learned that I can't use LOL because it means Lucifer is Lord. Our Lord. I'm sorry. So I'll never use that again. But I'm thinking about. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on, man. That's like saying, that's like saying you, they, people tell me you can't say hello, Rex. There's hell and, and there's an O in it, too. So now you're saying hell and O at the same time. <laughs> like, Lucifer, yeah. our Lord. LOL. <laughs> but anyway, think about 1984, Rex, not the year, but the novel. And you had a segmented society where people were uh, genetically engineered to not to, to be not only proficient at their level of society, but to be not only resistant to other levels of society, but to be completely happy in their level of society. And how easy would it be if you had this intelligent dust and you could dust a certain amount of people that you needed to be the worker bees, you could dust a certain amount of people that you needed to be the artist, you could dust a certain amount of people that needed to be the athletes. You could literally have a designer society and you're talking about how they're putting ears and eyes on people through grasshoppers and stuff. Rex, some people have said this, and it didn't really make a lot of sense to me until we started having this discussion. Are we the grasshoppers? Are we the eyes and ears of these other godlike beings that just want to know what it's like to experience what we're here? Like a Nacho Libre, they just want to have a little test to see what it tastes like. Yeah, why not? It's like a, a newer advanced version of going to a movie except for you know it's like okay well now i get to watch it on a different scale they're probably watching us from the moon like the the truman show and there could be more truth to that than fiction now i would like to say this though what if the levels of vr technologies and augmented realities this is where i see it going also in the very near future people given the opportunity to live an entire lifetime in a matter of a second or a minute. So what you would do is you would be hooked up to a machine, a system that you could create your own life and you would experience what we do now, except for it could be at a level of how long do you want to go in? Like inception style, but with technology, you want to go in for 50 years. You want to go in for a hundred years. You want to go in as a um, Titan. You want to go in as uh, Superman. What do you want to go in as? And you would be able to go in that, or let's take this to the other spectrum. What if they start to use this for law enforcement or punishment for crimes and they start going, oh, eh, let's go get, you know, bear, unburying people, taking their DNA, finding their DNA from crimes they committed hundreds of years ago and then recloning them to make them deal with a punishment or even a virtual reality type prison where they would think that they were dealing multiple lifetimes, a thousand years 10,000 years, however many lifetimes, but in reality, it was just a minute. So they get out of, what would it be like? Could you imagine that? A thousand years incarcerated, but it was just a minute. And then you come out of that minute, but you really thought it was a thousand years. Like what would that do to you? It's staggering. The implications of that are staggering. And when you think about, you know, anything that we believe created us. If you believe you've been created, I would say it's almost a ubiquitous belief that whomever or whatever our creators are, that they stand outside of time and that this whole universe that we're in could just be a daydream of some uh, God with ADD and that everything that we've been through is, I mean, it, it, you know, it's like row, row, row your boat. They're row, row, rowing their boat gently down a stream Merrily, 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 our life really is but a dream, or is it a dream 
within a dream, within a dream. And, you know, it's almost enough, Rex, to where you get to the point, and I can't remember the dude's name that was in The Matrix. I think it's the first Matrix movie. And he he has that meeting with, with Agent Smith, and he's sitting there, and he's eating the steak, and he's like, you know, I know this steak doesn't taste real, but or isn't real, but it sure tastes good. I know this wine isn't real, but it tastes great. You know, I know that this cigar is not real, but man, it's great. And he got, he was a warrior. He was a fighter. He was doing battle against the matrix, but he got tired, Rex, and he got weary and he got worn out. And he said, you know what? Go ahead and plug me back in, you know, make me a rock star, make me a movie star. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of doing battle plug me back in. And I know sometimes Rex, we get tired and we take our lumps and we have bad things happen to us, but brothers and sisters, cousins of all ages, we got to stand strong. I know that the, ta- the the steak looks good and the wine looks good and the cigars look good, but man, it's just not worth it. Hold out. I really think that we're going to turn this tide. I really think that no matter how bad it looks right now, that some way, somehow, We're going to be able to pull this thing out. And I don't know, Rex, I just don't know, but I still think that at the end of the day, at least some of us come out on our feet. And instead of giving in, let's go back to the way the old Greeks were. Let's either come back carrying our sword or let's go or come back carrying our shield or go out on our shield. Let's not quit. Never, never quit. Never surrender. Let's stand strong. Let's fight this thing through till the end. You know, it's, it's interesting because I'm reading through the comment section here, Jeff, and Harry says, Rex, get a grip. And then I, and I scroll down to see what Harry had to say, and he goes, we're in a war, man. We got to watch out. So who, who needs to get a grip here? <laughs> I'm good. I'm, I'm fantastic. I'm just bringing up ideas, and if I'm thinking it, they're thinking it. If I'm thinking it, they've probably already done it. So this information is for anybody – to, I mean, you can decide for yourself and I'm sharing with you links and data for the white papers and, and the information that's been presented. So come up with your own conclusion. And uh, I, I mean, if it doesn't jive with you, that's great. I, I think that that's fantastic. So it, it's good to have a differing opinion. However, when you give somebody an opportunity to think for themselves and they don't want to, because they feel, because they just, like you said, they, they want to keep eating that steak. They, they don't want to have that, that porridge. They would much rather have a holographic steak and, and be plugged into the machine and be comfortable. And I get that. That's, I, I am not judging against that whatsoever. I totally get it. I mean, I've had conversations with family members before that I, you know, just my whole life, I, I, I've talked to them like I'm talking to you and people on the project and they, you know, I'm trying to help them. And it's actually kind of, it's just, they can't accept it. They can't think about it. They, it's not something, and, and it's because it's just hard on them. You know, I mean, people need to think a certain way because sometimes some people, if they knew what was really going on behind closed doors, it might be too much for them. So we've got to realize that. And me personally, I've got to realize that sometimes, Hey, um, if, if I'm not talking about this stuff here, I'm talking the other day, I got uh, a tire for my car. I remember the, the guy, we, would, we had to drive it around for a minute because it was shaking at a, you know, at a higher speed. So I had to take him out and, and so he could see it. And that was from that crazy experience I had where I got stuck in Dragon, Utah, uh, searching those mines. But um, <laughs> the whole time I'm talking to him about, you know, because uh, they were spraying like crazy in the skies. I'm like, man, they're spraying like crazy today. I was talking about the petroglyphs that I've been exploring and, you know, all these different theories to somebody I met, you know, he's like listening to my car and I'm like talking about this kind of stuff. So um, some people are ready for it and, and some people aren't, but I think that uh, sometimes we just got to realize when, who to talk to about it and, and who not to talk to about it. That's the beauty of YouTube. And that's the beauty of leak project. That's the beauty of your channel and your channel is now cosmic awareness or cosmic knowledge. New Cosmic Knowledge. I'm the artist formerly known as the Christian Whistleblower, now New Cosmic Knowledge. Awesome. New Cosmic Knowledge. Yeah, I like that. That's got a a good ring to it. So that's what I love about these platforms is we are of, you know, many of us are kind of on the same mindset and the the same frequency. We're, We're looking for the truth. We're getting data. We're coming up to our own conclusions. We're looking for as much information as possible. And I think that 90 something percent of the people that listen to Leak Project are very genuine, very intelligent, 
and would help you out if you needed shoes and they had some shoes, if, you know, even if they had to walk home barefoot and they could, and you needed the shoes more than them, they'd give them to you. I, I really feel that. And um, I, I think it's great. I think it's absolutely fantastic. So I think that the more we can, how do I put it? The more we can focus our energies into things that will make a difference. So like, you know, you used to be a minister and you, you might have 500. Don't hold that against me, Rex. I won't hold it anywhere near you. <laughs> um, Hello. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so like you used to be, you know, you're talking to 500,000 people. I don't know how many people were part of your congregation, but you're helping. Well, the largest lot. audience that I ever spoke in front of Rex was about 124,000 people at a soccer stadium in Guatemala city. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. Was that, was that regular though? Was that a normal thing? What was your normal size congregation? Oh, probably around a thousand ish. Okay. And that's good. That's fantastic. That's a pretty good sized church. Now you have a YouTube channel with, and you have over 27,000 subscribers and you, your, your channel is growing great, by the way. I mean, it just seems like it's really taken off this year and I can see why, but it's, so now you're talking to a huge network of people all around the world. You're talking to these little pockets that are looking for certain information and they find that you are a very knowledgeable person to get that data from. So I, well, I thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, you're very welcome. So it's just amazing the way the world is getting, you know, it's changing and for a very, I think it's great. Like, like I, I talk about a lot of the negative things oftentimes because I think that that needs to be brought up. People need to be aware of that. And at the same time, we, we need to ex expect the best uh, prepare for the worst. That's why I started to study hypnosis. That's why I started to study magic and the occult and mysticism and, and all of these arts, because I wanted to find out what was being used against me, what they were doing to me. And then I'm like, wow, like it's amazing how much conversational hypnosis they can put in a 30 second commercial. By the end of that commercial, you, you can be under mind control and then you're going to sleep and then you're asleep and these commercials are playing over and over again as you're asleeping. It's going directly into your subconscious mind and it's bypassing the filters that are there when you're awake and people just, they don't care. Most a lot of people need TV to go to sleep. That's really scary. Going to sleep, listening to a TV, but you know, Rex it, and one of the chatters, Luma Chata has made a joke about a brow sweat. Believe it or not, Rex, I was a preacher for 20 years and I was one of these, you know, we heal you. we, you get baptized, the Holy Ghost cast out demons. And most of the preachers would have like this anointing oil, olive oil that they take out a little bottle and anoint your head with it. Rex, I took it to a whole new level. I was always sweaty. So I would just take the very sweat of my brow and put it on people and heal them and do the thing. And it's the amazing thing in 20 years, people would line up hundreds of people. Here's some crazy guy wiping his sweat on them. Nobody ever complained. Nobody ever got out of line. Nobody ever said, don't do that to me. And these are different people that we're talking to and, you know, talking to the people in the chat room, you know, this isn't me tube, this is YouTube. And this is about you guys and what Rex and I do and all the people that we work with, we bring you to water, but you have to decide if you want to drink, we bring you to truth. You have to decide, or we at least bring you to information. You have to decide if you want to think. And the thing I really appreciate about what you do, Rex, and I try to emulate it, don't do a very good job, but I try to emulate it in some fashion is we can get too serious and too much seriousness makes things too heavy. We forget that life is a game and we forget it's a game that we can win. So I appreciate you for leading the way and showing us that we got to have, we got to be serious sometimes, but it's also a time for fun. It's a time for pleasure. It's a time for enjoyment. And if you ever are in a church and the preacher is wiping his own brow of sweat and putting it on you, get out of line. Don't do it. Can you smell that sweat? You just smell it. All right. So very interesting. Yeah. The, the sweat magic, sweat magic, so, sweat magic. I need to write a book. <laughs> this is interesting. What we're looking at right here is some satellites orbiting the earth and just kind of showing you an idea. And I was thinking to myself, this was a pretty good visual in conjunction with the semantics that I was showing and the different vibrational frequencies that create different shapes. And I wanted to go back to this one just for a moment. These are all different shapes that are created when you just, you, you throw some dust onto a piece of paper, you create these different sounds and look at this. I mean, look at some of these symbols go back um, ancient times. And I really think 
there is a lot more to the electric universe theory than people have given it credence for. So I'm going to start doing a lot more digging into the gods and the wars in heaven and these petroglyphs and all these symbols and extreme events that have taken place. Cause I also feel that these extreme events that people were documenting thousands of years ago, and they're showing these, you know, they're writing, they're, they're drawing what looks like extraterrestrials and beans that look like ant beans and mantis beans and grays and stuff like that. I think there's a very good chance when these events take place, these catastrophes, they're, they come in and out to help us. But we, you know, maybe there's something in play to where they can't come around at specific times and just be like, hey, Bob, man, let's go play some pool. You guys have the best pool tables out here, out there in space. We don't have enough room on that spaceship. So can I play some pool with you? No, it's like they got to come down here and be like, okay, you're going in that cave for three days because there's going to be these giant electrical discharges from space. So you need to stay in there for three days because if you come out before then, it's going to vaporize you. And I think that's what the natives were telling us, man. There's, I've seen so many petroglyphs. We've got these, these ant beans that are like pointing up at the sky and they're smiling and they're next to humans. And they're like, hey, how's it going? They saved us. It's just too much to be a coincidence. So, but I also want to say the semantics. Let's go back to the semantics. Imagine the possibility, once again, of all these you know, particulates and then certain vibrational frequencies, et cetera. Well, this right here is at metabunk.org. I want you to go to this article, metabunk.org. You see these brain scans, A and B? These are supposed to be from two different people. And this is actually, if you look at it carefully, you'll see it's from the same person. One of these is supposed to be from a brain scan of somebody that isn't religious. And the next one is supposed to be someone that is religious. Well, I think they did a great job debunking the fun vax article. And I think there could be some fun vax type technologies, but this right here, I think they did a good job of debunking because in this article, if you watch the actual presentation, when the guy's showing the, uh, the different brain scans on the, on the screen, they're the same brains and he's saying that they're different. So, but they talk about how they're, they're, they wanted to spray these particulates that could piggyback off of like flu, flu viruses and stuff, get embedded in people's brains and take away the God gene. So kind of rewrite their brain to where they didn't have that faith or that connection to God, kind of like even more so calcifying the pineal gland. And I definitely think there's a good chance of the technology existing. Absolutely. But it was interesting to see how well they did debunking that specific article on the fun backs. But let's add to that. So control the narrative. What if you come up with that technology you have, or you learn about the technology from an, you know, from something like that, you create the technology, but now people just have that article that was debunked to reference. So they think it's all fake. What are your thoughts? Well, you know what, Rex, as you were talking, I was just thinking of a new catchphrase. How about debunk yourself? I think that's a good one debunk yourself. Well, I mean, if you're in a bunker, then that might even be more exciting because you're like digging yourself out of the bunker. That, and that, and that there's a, a whole podcast. new, a whole new, uh, a whole new reality show. But you know, as you talk about this, Rex, I, I, I saw this yesterday. I took a picture of it with my cell phone. I'm walking into Publix, which is our grocery store here on the West coast of Florida. And here's this big, huge banner covering the whole front of the grocery store. And I, I swear to you on, on the life of, of Rooney, the new cosmic kitten, that there's this big banner and it says flu shots. Get your flu shot and get a $20 discount on your groceries. Get a flu shot. Get a $20 discount on your groceries. I think the margin of profit in a grocery store is like 1% or 2%. How can they afford to give everybody 20 bucks just because they get a flu shot. And why are they so motivated to get people to get flu shots? It's almost Rex like they want us to get them because I don't know. They want us to get them. Why do they want us to get them? Makes me more than a little bit skeptical. Am I just a crazy conspiracy theorist or does that make anybody else wonder? Oh, no, man. It's just because they love you. And, you know, they, that's the, true. The, I know. The, the aluminum and the thimerosal that's in a lot of the flu shots, um, that, that's really because they love you. And there is a <laughs> video, there's a video that you can watch that is at about 7.9 million views. And it is just a science video. I would recommend people watch. And I think I've even got it um, liked on my 
uh, homepage. So you can watch it from my homepage. Somebody else did this video. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with vaccines, doesn't have anything to do, you know, with any conspiracies, anything else. What you do though, is you, you see this, this gentleman has, or you see somebody with gloves on and there's uh, like a Petri dish set up and there is uh, liquid aluminum on the Petri dish, right? So a, a couple drops of liquid aluminum. And then this person drops uh, a piece of mercury on the aluminum. And when that happens, you'll notice that the, the thing grows like those, like um, the firework things, the little snakes that are just a little pebble and then you lie to them, they turn oh, into yeah. a snake. Or something that would even be more of an explanation. Do you remember if, if anybody ever had a swimming pool or has a swimming pool, um, you, you, you've got those things you can purchase. You throw the, the castles, the crystal castles, you throw them in the pools and they, they turn into these long crystal castles. Well, this you'll watch this video, this time lapse video, and you'll see that it goes from liquid form to within a matter of seconds, it grows into this like what looks like a castle. And it's several inches tall and it's all stringy and yucky and nasty. And it reminds me a lot of Mergellans. The, uh, there's somebody that's been sending me a bunch of pictures that is dealing with this horrific nightmare right now. And it looks like inside of their skin, there's speaker wires, S speaker wires inside of their skin. And the best thing I can compare it to is that video that I saw of the mercury and aluminum. So folks, it's just because they love you. And that's why they can do that because they care about you so much. But I also wanted to talk about the, the future possibility here. Uh, this is an interesting article that I found, futureworld.com or futureworld.org, nanovirus panic at Boston Tech Fest. Now, this is just a what if scenario in the future. It's a what if scenario in the future. But it talks about how people actually get infected with computer viruses in their bodies. A computer virus jumps from the computer to the human body. And that sounds far out to some. And I would like to remind those people that that sounds far out to there have been universities that have embedded information in human DNA and have also embedded computer viruses in human DNA along with the different code that stores books and CDs and movies and uh, algorithms and data, et cetera. And they can actually right now store two and a half billion gigahertz inside of one gram of human DNA. Now, over the past 10 years, that has expanded substantially. And the only reason you don't have DNA hard drives right now available at the stores is because the cost to extract the data is too expensive. However, the future of storage is going to be DNA storage because they can put so much data inside of DNA and they're not going to be able to have the space in the future to just store the data that's presented on the webs right now and all these electronic interfaces because there's so much information out there that this is the future. And if they can store 215 billion gigahertz right now in one gram of DNA that's human, imagine what they're going to be able to do 10 years from now. And then what about the DNA genome project that used to be a billion dollars to break down the DNA? Now you can do it for less than 100 bucks. It's going to be the same thing with this, in my opinion. A few years from now, 10 years from now, you're going to be able to go out and buy yourself a hard drive that you fit in the palm of your hand, that you can store all the information that's available on the web right now. So unless, unless the corporations decide to slowly bring that out into the corporate or into the residential realms because of their way, you know, just, okay, here's a new product. Here's a new product. Here's a new product. The stuff they have patents on right now would completely obliterate the stuff we have access to. They just have to bring it out over a period of time because that's, the way that many of these corporations work. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a corporation out there that instead of coming up with technologies that have been around for years, if they had the technology that was out now, bring it out now. Like smartphones, foldable smartphones. Okay, great. We're finally going to see a foldable smartphone again in, in a few months, but it's still barbaric compared to what we could have. We could have holographic things that would pop out of our you know, watch that like, eh, would be interlaced with just something you could like a contact lens that you could do facial recognition. You could pick up, you could go to a different country. And if they're speaking a language you don't understand, it could translate that for you immediately. It could tell you where you need to go, when you need to go. I mean, there's so much tech we could have right now that would fit in the palm of your hand that would, that could be brought out with these corporations that they have patents on, but they just have to slowly, slowly do it. So um, we, we live in amazing times here, man. This is amazing. So do you think that we could go, in the future where not only are people worrying about biological viruses, they're gonna to have to worry about computer viruses messing up their brains.
Johnny Mnemonic style. It's amazing stuff, Rex, just to, to ponder this. And I was just sitting here thinking, you know, right now we're in a world where because of anti-death technology and because of, you know, some, you know, medical advancements and things of that nature and improvement in nutrition, we've got like this population explosion. And whether you believe that it's overpopulation or not, you can't argue that there's, you know, arguably some 8 billion people on the planet. And yet from all of the data that we can see and, you know, put together and uh, some by conjecture, but most by just uh, objective empirical research, they don't want anywhere near that amount of people. But Rex, if you think about it, why are they promoting things to have this population explosion when they really don't want that many people to manage? But if you're trying to create data farms where you can store your data in the future, maybe they're trying to make a whole bunch of humans and then just turn a whole lot more of them, a lot of them into data storage centers, just like a data center now that's filled with racks and racks of servers. Maybe we'll have the, the uh, human DNA servers and then we'll have the class of people that actually really get to be people. So they, they love us so much that they want to grow us and they want to farm us and make us into human DNA data farms. And then they'll select the 550,000 or whatever it is there on the, the Georgia Guidestones, which I went to and took a video of, but for some reason can't remember the number. Or is that just too crazy, Rex? You can't remember the number? Like you can't remember which video it was because you've done no, so many. No, I, I can't remember what the, the, the level of population they wanted, but it was a 500, lot less. 500,000. It's 500,000. 500,000. So do you create all these people because you want to take them and use their bodies, use their parts and data servers and other kind of things? And then you want to take your 500,000 elite and let those billions just uh, hold the data and store the data that make the life better for the select and the chosen few, the ones that, that they really, really love. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. Take 7 billion people, use them as the data and the computer systems and the storage facilities for, you know, however many decide to make the decisions. And then if you go up at the top levels beyond, I mean, even beyond these big names that people think when, you know, they're thinking of these top world bankers and elitists, let's go above and beyond that names that you'll probably never hear. And if you do, um, you probably won't repeat it. And maybe these things, like you said, yeah, it could be using 7 billion people, seven and a half billion people to make themselves greater and stronger and, and mightier. But I wouldn't be surprised if there gets to be a population of 10 to 15 billion on the planet, maybe even all the way up to 20 billion before there's that major reset. And also, I, I do want to add to the Georgia Guidestones. They don't really say that's what they want. And they don't really say if elitists are going to create that by war and famine, it could be a natural disaster. It could be, you know, some, some giant geomagnetic storms. It could be an asteroid. It could be Yellowstone erupting. So maybe there, that was in place just for after, like the hey, future. And they're saying, Rex, yeah. Could it be gulp? Could it be the rapture? Could it be the event? Could it be something that people would welcome? We'll take out billions and they'll be happy to go. But again, I'm just a crazy conspiracy theorist. My thoughts are with the Georgia guy. So this is just my thoughts. I feel that whoever erected that has, you like that word? Erected. Said erect. Ladies and gentlemen, we just listened to it. Um, so <laughs> that sounded bad. Now, <laughs> you said erection. Um, there was the... 500,000, the top on the Georgia Guidestone. I think that maybe whoever put that, the money and time and resources into those Guidestones knew about a future event, whether it's a million years from now, a thousand years from now, 10 years from now. And they were just projecting what they saw as the future after there's a reset. Because there's been a lot of resets in the past that I don't think were, were man-made. And I would also like to add that I think that if you go back and read about these ancient tablets and you see these hieroglyphics of the giants, and then you'll see kings that are talked about thousands of years ago bowing to these giants and these gods. I think those are the ones that are in play. I think those are the ones that are ruling the world. And, and maybe they know just every X amount of years, there's going to be this event that unfolds. And then at the next reset, that's what they want to see. What if 
we as a civilization, Jeff, could come up with enough technologies and resources and enough just willpower to create a fleet of ships that could launch out into space. So while there are these cataclysms that take place on Earth, we could survive and then we could come back at a certain time. Life extension technologies, all this stuff is at the palm of our hands right now. We just need to get access to it. We need to convince the MFers that it would be of their best interest to let us use these technologies as well, because not only is it gonna make us greater, it's gonna make them greater. And then this is gonna be our best shot, our best opportunity to get over anything that would completely destroy us. And it's gonna be their best shot as well. Because even the biggest, baddest person on the block they're going to find out there's somebody else out there on a different block that could just, you know, one shot and that's all it takes. So if we work together in harmony and if there's these MFers out there that realize it's going to take us as well as them to get over this, um, the, this next level, the, the Fermi paradox. Let's talk about the Fermi paradox for a minute. We should be seeing ETs all around us. With as big as the universe is on a daily basis, we, we should be making contact. We personally, like just normal, uh, every day, working nine to five, going home, you know, sucking down diet soda, people that don't even care, they should be making contact with ETs on a regular basis as well. But something seems to be, whether it's, you know, people get to a certain level, they blow themselves up, something happens, these resets. How do we get past this hump into the next level? And what you do just we said do? hump, Rex. Hump and erection. <laughs> All in the same show. <sighs> Rex. Are you Rex Bear? I'm asking you in front of all these people on live YouTube. Are you an extraterrestrial? I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised, but who's going to convince me of that? I think we're all extraterrestrials. Where are the ETs? It'd be hard to argue that, my friend. So let's close out with an awesome, an awesome segment of Jeff Darty ex-Christian whistleblower, now Cosmic Knowledge, and leave your YouTube channel. Let's, let's do that. And I think, you know, like Rex says, that at the end of the day, Rex and I are just the mailman. You know, sometimes we bring you bills and you hate us. Sometimes we bring you checks and you love us. But we are just here bringing the news. We're just delivering the information because the lamestream media is not going to give you the real information. So instead of getting mad and instead of wasting everybody's time writing hate mail and hate, you know, hate messages, just take the information. And if you like it, if you can use it, if it does something to help in your life, take advantage of it. If it doesn't, just let it go on by and go back to watching uh, Kardashians, but it'll be okay. So we're in this together. We know that it's a battle. Let's wake up and realize that it's a battle. And at the end of the day, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you choose. I hope you choose the best and highest way for yourself. But I'm just here to get you as much information as I can to help you unindoctrinate yourself and to create the life you love. And cousin, I'm here to tell you it's an inside job. And until you dare to go where no man has gone before, that's deep into your core of who you are. You're never going to be happy. You're never going to be satisfied and you're never going to know what it's like to really truly live. So I challenge you here today, the day before Halloween, why don't you scare the hell out of yourself and do something you've never done? Think of something you never thought, try something you never tried and see how that works for you. Cause if you keep doing the same things you've always done, you're going to get the same results you've always got. And let me just leave you with this question. How's that working for you? How's that working for you? Ladies and gentlemen, you need to check this out also. Go to minds.com. It is a crypto social network that will actually pay you in cryptos for your contributions. It's awesome. You can even build your own social network. And this is amazing because the way that it's designed is to reward those that actually bring something to the table. So it's a really neat opportunity. Check that out. And also, there is a really cool event coming up next year here in Colorado. It's called, oh yeah, you guessed it, LeakCon. <laughs> LeakCon. LeakCon. So people have been asking me for years now to put together a conference. And 
It's coming up, folks. It's going to be incredible. We've got some of the most amazing minds in the world that are going to be at this event. Uh, I think I'm also going to get Jeff to this event, depending on what he's going to be doing. And I know he's got so much going on, so I'm just kind of bringing this up to him right I'll now. I'll be there. And Rex, if everybody will line up, I'm getting the sweat brow ready. Get the sweat brow ready. But also, folks, you know, if you've ever watched Gallagher before, you know what happens when he busts out the watermelons. So, you know, it's like he does the, the watermelon smash. Remember the, uh, the Smash-O-Matic? You've seen Gallagher before. The smash matic So, yeah, we've got LeakCon coming up. It's going to be in Colorado. And we're going to have, I, I think, David Dubine is going to be there. He is very knowledgeable in the electric universe. Of course, Diamond, the legend from Oppenheimer Ranch, is going to be there. We're going to have, uh, I think, Greg Allison is going to be there. He is a rocket scientist. He builds rockets in his backyard. He also is contracted with NASA very knowledgeable individual. Um, he also builds wormholes. He creates wormhole generators that are available to the public. You should check out his website. And we're going to have many others that are going to be there. This is going to be a two-day conference. There's going to be VIP tickets. And, and there's also going to be, for those of you that can't make it to the event, we are going to have a limited number of live streams. So if you want to watch the event. But here's what makes this event so unique and different than many other events that have taken place that people might consider similar. Um, how do I put this in, in the most accurate fashion? How do I say this? So we're going to have guests at the events that are very knowledgeable in reference to the electric universe hypothesis. And we're going to show like scientific data. We're going to have paleontologists there. And I'm also going to bring the information from the Sumerian tablets, these ancient religions and scriptures. And we're going to see if we can correlate the data so, you know, not only with religious scriptures, but also with science, because if we can merge the two and build a timeline and find out why these petroglyphs are out there, why they're you know, estimated to be about a thousand years old, how many resets we've had, why, have we, why do we have evidence for five or six major floods over the past 200,000 years, how much of this information is accurate? Are we really a cloned race from an extraterrestrial race? What are we doing here? Where are we going? All these questions are so important. We're going to do our best to get to the bottom of all of these folks. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I want to thank everybody for being here with us. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to leave your links to your YouTube channel, also your website in the video description box. Be excellent to each other, everybody. Also go to leakproject.com. I've got many exclusive podcasts on leakproject.com. You can sign up for free. We've got a really neat forums section there if you're an avid blogger. And also don't forget, don't forget. Oh yeah, before I forget. I had a Black Hawk helicopter fly over my house today. That was kind of fun. And I'm in the middle of nowhere, Southern Colorado. So why is a Black Hawk helicopter flying over my house at 100 feet? I don't know. We'll leave that as a conspiracy. Be the change you want to see.